Uh, take out your sermon supplement for this morning, and if you open it up on the inside, you can find an outline for our lesson this morning, Our Three Directions of Love. We're going to say something about that title in just a second, but you can follow along there on your outline. You can also follow along on the screen uh, behind me if we get going a little too fast or you, you miss a scripture reference. They're all written down there uh, for you, so you'll be able to go back later and to look at them. Certainly we would all agree that God loves us. Romans chapter 5 and verse 8 says, But God demonstrates His own love toward us in this, while we were yet still sinners. Now listen, Christ died for the ungodly. So the, the question is, that does God love us? Absolutely God loves us. And the focus of our lesson this morning isn't from the perspective of whether or not God loves us. Our focus this morning is from the perspective of how do we express our love. And so if you notice there on the title, we're talking about some personal responsibility this morning. We're talking about us, me, you. We're talking about the three directions that our love should go. So I, I just want to preface by, by sharing that this morning because our focus is, a, is just a little bit different. We're, we're looking at us and we're seeing how are we doing in the area of, of love. How are we doing when it comes to expressing um, our love to those around us? Certainly, please hear me, church. Certainly, God's love is vital, essential, important, and necessary. And we spend time talking about that. But what about your love? What's the condition of your love for others? What's the condition of your love for God? If you'll permit me to say it this way, we're doing a little internal soul searching this morning to answer that that question. I'm fond of a story that I, I heard many years ago, and in fact, I had a little post-it note on my desk, and I left it in there, and, I, and I'm pretty sure I've got the names right, but I might not. The dad's name was Mark, and I believe the son's name was Shane, and if that's not right, just flip it. Dad was Shane, and son was Mark, but nevertheless, it's a, a story that has uh, always reminded me of the power of love. Uh, Mark was a fireman. In fact, uh, Mark was a decorated uh, fireman. He had been uh, rewarded several times for uh, uh, running into buildings, for saving people who were in distress, and he was uh, well known among the fire uh, fighting community as being a man who had displayed time and time again valor, uh, bravery. Mark took his son, 12-year-old son Shane fishing one day. They went out onto a lake. And they'd spent the day fishing, and night was coming, and they were beginning to put things away, and the lake began to get a little choppy. And nobody's quite sure how it happened, but somehow Shane, the 12-year-old, fell overboard. And Mark tried everything he could to get his son back into the boat, but with the lake being choppy and the, the waves and, and the sun kind of was getting pushed further and further away from the boat, so Mark did the only thing he could. He jumped into the water. He swam out to his son and he began to pull him back to the boat. But they had a problem. His son was small. Small for a 12-year-old. And he just wasn't strong enough nor tall enough to reach the edge of the boat to pull himself up. And of course, Mark holding on to him did everything he could in the water to try and, 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 and lift him up. But he had nothing to push off from. He, he, he couldn't get him high enough to grab onto the side of the, the boat. And he tried everything he could to put his own hand up there and try to pull it, and it just wouldn't work, and so he had to do the only thing he could. He went underneath the water, grabbed his son by the bottom of his feet, and with all he could, he pushed upward and pushed his son up onto the ledge and into the boat. In doing that, he hit his head on the bottom of the boat, and he drowned. At Mark's funeral, his son spoke. And he said something very simple. I, I, I wrote it down because I wanted to get it right. And his 12-year-old son, Shane, said this of his father, Mark. He said, I knew that my dad loved me, but by saving me, he showed me he loved me. You see, that's what we're talking about this morning. We're not talking about saying we love someone. We're talking about how do we show it. 
We're not talking about belittling the importance of speaking those words, I love you, I care about you, I, I, I want to do everything. We're, we're not belittling that, but we're saying, what is the expression? What is the, the physical demonstration of the confession that we make that we love? You remember Romans 5 and verse 8? But God demonstrates His own love. It's not enough that He says, I love you, I love you. No, He had to demonstrate that love in a tangible way, in a way that is real. A father going under the water risking his own life, giving his life to put his son back in the boat is a demonstration of love. How do you demonstrate your love? We're going to talk about three ways that we can do it this morning. Go over, if you will, for just a moment to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I want to begin in verse 1 with the understanding that, that love is absolutely essential. That it must be for every one of us a a compelling attribute, an attribute, a quality, a characteristic. An attribute is something that defines and describes who we are as a people of faith. It must be a part of who we are as, as Christians. And Paul begins to address this, the essential nature of, of love, and he's talking about from our perspective. Remember that. He's talking about how we demonstrate it, how important it is in, in our life. And Paul says this, he says, Though I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, now notice what he says, I have become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. I'm just making noise. He doesn't deny the fact that, that something wonderful was done. I'm speaking in the tongues of angels. I'm uttering things that God would have me say. But in the absence of love, I'm just making noise. He goes on and he says these words, And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains but have not love, notice, I am nothing doesn't matter about the great feats that I've done, the wonderful things that have been accomplished. It doesn't matter that I have wowed those around me by laying waste to mountains. In the absence of love, I'm nothing. Verse 3, And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. I'd give you just a little modern day twist on that number three. And Paul is essentially saying, if we were to express it kind of in the everyday common language, Paul is saying, if I give it all up but I don't have love, what good is it? What, what, what benefit has been done? And what Paul does in those first three verses, now you're probably very familiar with verse 4 and following on the attributes of what love is. But in those first three verses, Paul says, listen, it's an essential attribute. He gives us the understanding, he lays the foundation for us, that we must be a people of, of love. That we must be those who in a tangible way go beyond simply lip service. Well, sure, I love you. But how do you love? Well, you know, I mean, of, of course I love you. But how do you show me that you love me? Well, listen, look, how, how many times have I told you, I, you know, I, I love you? No, but how do you demonstrate it to me? So again, we're talking about our three directions of love and how that love is manifested to those around us. And we begin with the understanding is it's absolutely essential that we have to be a people of love. Go over, if you will, to, to Mark chapter 12. And th these verses are going to be up on your outline, but I, I, I always like us to turn to these passages so we, we stay in the habit of finding these scriptures in our, in our Bible. And in Mark chapter 12, we have a wonderful in, in, encounter that, that takes place here with, with a scribe and Jesus. And it gives us a, an understanding of the direction of our love. And beginning there in verse 28, it says this, And one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, perceiving that he had answered them well, that's that Jesus had answered them well, he asked Jesus, which is the first commandment of all? Some of your translations say, what, what's the greatest commandment? What's the first commandment out of all the things that God has said? Out of all the things that God has commanded us as His people, a people desiring to serve Him, His question to Jesus is just right to the point. Which one is number one? You see? Which one takes priority over all the other commandments that, 
that God has said. Beginning there in, in verse 29, Jesus says this, The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Now, notice, this is the first commandment. And the second is like it. It is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. So, so the scribe said to him, well said, teacher, you have spoken the truth. For there is one God and there is no other but he. And to love him with all the heart and with all understanding, with all soul and with all the strength. And to love one's neighbor as oneself is more than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Verse 34. Now when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. Jesus said, You get it. In, in, in agreeing with the things that I have just said, Jesus says, you, you're, you're going in the right direction. You're understanding what I'm trying to say. You're, you're at the verge of understanding the great importance of love. Love for God and love for those around us. And what I want you to notice is just in those few verses, Jesus gives us an understanding of the three directions of our love. The, the first direction is, is upward toward God. And that's how he begins there. And he tells us that we have to love God with all that we have, right? With all of our heart, our soul, our mind, and strength. We love God with everything. We don't hold it back. We give it all. We hear the baseball players say when they're being interviewed or the football players, how, how, how'd you pull out this victory? Man, I gave it my all. How is it that you were able to come from behind? Oh, let me tell you, I dug deep and I just gave everything I had. I left it all on the field. That's what Jesus is saying we need to do when it comes to loving God. We, we leave it all out there. He, he's saying don't be a people who are reserved. You understand? Don't, don't hold back when it comes to loving God. Give them everything that you absolutely have. Give it from all that you are. So he tells us that our love goes upward to God. The second thing he tells us is it goes outward towards other. Because he follows it up and says, you shall love your neighbor. That it's not just enough that I go upward in my love. Jesus says that the love has to go outward. We're not belittling the importance of loving God. This isn't an, an either or. This is in addition to. So we're being called to have a, a, a big love here. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verses 1 through 3. That's a big type of love. And I can't limit it to just that one direction. Or I can't say, well, I'll just put everything in that direction and forget everything else. No, it, it encompasses all of this. Upward towards God and outward towards other. I need to love my neighbor. And then the third direction is one that we sometimes forget. Not only does our love go upward, not only does our love go outward, but Jesus says that our love goes inward toward self. Did you catch it? He says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, literally, what he is saying is this. You shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. And we do, don't we? We do. You want to know how much you love yourself? Hold your hand over. Oh, don't do this. <laughs> Hold your hand over a, a hot flame. What do you do? Well, you eventually pull your hand back, don't you? Sure you do. Why? Ah, oh, because you love yourself. You want, to, you, want to, you want to make sure that you're okay. You want to make sure that no harm uh, comes to you. It's not difficult for us to love ourselves. And sometimes the problem that we encounter is that we're real good about that inward love and we're not too good about the outward or the upward love, right? Well, it just becomes me, what I want, what I think, what I desire, what I crave. It becomes that inward love in which we begin to say, well, I'm not really concerned about what you need or what you think. I'm just kind of concerned about what I need and what I think. And you know, God's a big God and He can take care of Himself. And there's plenty of other people that will show their love to God. So I'm okay. I'm just going to focus on me, me, me. But it's simply not possible, according to Mark chapter 12, verses 28 through 34, to have a one directional love. It's not possible because Jesus combines all of these together, this direction. And he gives us the understanding that it must. It has to go upward. It has to go outward. 
And it has to have a healthy inward direction. Well, how do you do in those areas? I mean, when, when you think about the, the love that you have, when you, you think about loving God and loving others, and loving, how, how are you doing? You don't need me to tell you. You don't need those sitting around you to tell you. How do you perceive things as going? The second thing that I want us to look at this morning is it's easy to say, yeah, you know, Brother Don, I get it. <laughs> okay. Th those are great three directions. And, and uh, there's nothing in me that would argue with you. I agree with what Jesus is saying. I'm good about it. The, the difficulty then is, well, how do we do it? <laughs> you say. Okay, how do I express that upward love? How do I as a person, with, with all the difficulties and the struggles that I have and the things that, that can be hard and having relationships with those around how do I express that outward love to, to those around me? And just what is a healthy inward love? I mean, it's not the I, I have to do it. I get that. It's the, it's the how. How do I do this? Let me offer you some suggestions this morning on how we can fulfill these three directions of our of our love. Here, here's the first suggestion: as a people of faith, when we uh, when we talk about our our upward love toward God, it, it can be manifested in many ways. I'm just giving you a, just a couple suggestions here to get you going in in that direction. The, the first thing that we see is in this upward love toward God. It's seen in our obedience to Him. We're talking about how it's manifested. We're not talking about the, the lip service. We're talking about the doing. Um, we say it this way, where the rubber meets the road, right? Uh, I'm, I talk the talk and I'm walking the walk. This is the application part, the how I do these things. Go over to, to John chapter 14 and notice in verse 15. Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. We're talking about expressing in a tangible way manifesting that upward love to God. What does Jesus say? Do the things that I've asked you to do. Worship as I asked you to worship. Uh, serve as I've asked you to serve. Be obedient in the areas that I've asked you to be obedient. Be moral in the areas that I've asked you to be moral. The things that I've commanded you to do, if you love me, then go out and do those things. That practical application in your life. It's my upward expression of love toward God. Another way in which that is done is that in loving others, it shows that I love God. And we don't always think about it in those terms, but it's true. Go over to, to 1 John. You're in, in, in the Gospel of John, so you have to turn towards the end of your, your New Testament. In 1 John chapter 4, beginning in verse 20, notice what John says. He says, if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not? Seen. Now, I'll give you verse 21, but think about that for a second. It's not, does my brother frustrate me? Absolutely. <laughs> it's not, do I feel that my brother is doing things that are ungodly, unholy, unscriptural? Well, of course that takes place. It's not that my brother has hurt me or offended me. Those things occur. It's not that I agree with what my brother is doing. We may not agree. That's not the issue. Those things need to be dealt with in their proper perspective. The issue is, listen, how can I be one who says that I love God, yet I don't love others? How is that possible? And in verse 21, he says this, And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God, we're talking about the upward manifestation, demonstration of a love for God. How can he say that he loves God? Uh, who he, say, he who says he must love God must love his brother also. And it's the connection that loving others shows that I love God. You're looking for two ways to express your upward love toward God? Be obedient to what He says. Live according to the pattern that He has offered to us through divine inspiration. Be one who reaches out to those around you and expressing your love to them. You're showing your love for God. It's that upward demonstration. Let, let me give you a second Suggestion. We're talking about that outward love towards others. Well, how can that be manifested? Well, I'll give you three suggestions. The first one is the understanding that there's those times when we're called to love when others aren't being very loving towards us. Again, these are demonstrations. Go over to, to Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6. And I want to pick up just kind of in the middle of what's taking place there. Verse 27. And it says this, But I say to you who hear, love your enemies. 
Now, notice the context that is set for us. It's not our buddies, our pals, our friends. The, the, the context that is being set by Jesus are clearly those that are at odds with us. Clearly those that we're at odds with. Is it possible for one to have enemies? Well, of course it is. Well, how do you know, Brother Yes, Because I read Luke chapter 6 and verse 27. Where Jesus sets forth the context that there are those at times who are our enemies. And he says this. He says, but I say to you, uh, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. And pray for those who spitefully use you. Notice the... the the harshness that is being laid out. There's, it, it's not that they're being good or kind. It's not that they're being beneficial or helpful. It's just the opposite of how they are treating to him. To him who strikes you on the one cheek, offer the other also. And from him who takes your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who asks of you. And from him who takes away your goods, do not ask them back. And just as you want men to do to you, you also do to them likewise. The great golden rule there in verse 31. But if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Well, that's easy. Well, it's easy to love those who are being loving towards me. For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you hope to receive back, what credit is that to you? For even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much back. But love your enemies. It's that outward expression. Do good and lend, hoping for nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for He is kind to the unthankful and evil. Therefore, be merciful, just as your Father also is merciful. I want to express that outward love. I want to truly demonstrate that love that I am trying to manifest for those around me, my, my neighbor, my brothers, my friends, my acquaintances, the strangers. How can I do it? Well, I can manifest it when I return love for hatred. I'm not saying it's easy. And, and I want you to hear this. I'm not saying it's always fun. But it is a way in which Jesus gives us the understanding that we manifest the fact that we are loving. A second suggestion that I'll give you when we talk about outward love, loving others, is understanding that when we share the gospel with others, we are showing a great love for them. Go over to 1 Corinthians, if you will. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, I want you to notice what Paul says beginning there in verse 19. Paul's talking about how he loved others. And notice how he expresses it. He says this, For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win the more. So everything that's going to follow is Paul's reasoning for why he is willing to reach out to others and make himself this servant. And he says this, he says, And to the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law, as under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without law, as without law, not being without law toward God, but under law toward Christ, that I might win those who are without law. To the weak I became as weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Notice verse 23. Now this I do for the gospel's sake, that I may be a partaker of it with you. What is one of the great manifestations of love that I can have for those around me? Teach them the gospel. Not to leave them in a state in which they are in disobedience to God. Is that always received well? No. Are they always thankful that we lean over the fence there while they're cutting the grass and say, Hey, friend, I want to talk to you about Jesus Christ and what he means to you. Are they always that? No. But what is it from our perspective? It's us demonstrating the love for our neighbor. It's that outward expression. I love those people around me so much that I don't want to see them lost. I love people around me so much that I want to be like Paul. I want to meet them on their level. I want to be able to talk to them and converse them. My end goal is obvious. I don't want their money. I don't want fame. Listen, I'm after their soul. And I want to win them to Christ. It shows that we love them. Let me give you one more. Helping those who are already saved. 
Loving our brothers and sisters enough that we are concerned about their relationship with God. You're in 1 Corinthians, so keep turning forward and go over to Galatians chapter 6. And notice what Paul says in verse 1. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Consider in yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. It is an expression of my love when I reach out to a brother or sister who are in error. It's an expression of my love for their soul and my desire that they be right with God. Why? Listen, I believe in eternity. I believe that heaven is real. And as hard as it is for us at times to conceive of this right now in the here and now with all the hustle and the bustle and all the things that we have to do, all of this is going to end one day, friends. And maybe we're fortunate and we live to see the end and Jesus Christ comes. But there'll be an accounting. Or maybe we're not fortunate enough to be here when he returns and we die before he does. But there will be an accounting. And we love those around us so much that we want to reach out to a brother or sister that we see in error. And we want to win them back to the cause of Christ. We want to win them back to that pattern of sound doctrine that Paul writes about to the young evangelist Timothy. Why? Because we love them. Let me give you one more. We talk about the upward love, how we manifest it toward God. We've seen how we manifest that outward love towards other. Now let's talk about how we manifest that inward love towards self. A healthy, uh, a healthy love towards self. The, the, the first way is this, that we need to be saved and we need to live right. My spiritual condition matters. And you know, I ought to love myself enough to make sure that I am in a right relationship with God. You remember the person who holds their hand over the flame? I'm telling you, they're going to pull it back. Well, if we love our physical flesh that much that we don't want it to be harmed, we ought to love our soul enough that we don't want it to be lost. That's a healthy expression of how I love me. Go over, if you will, to, to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, and again, it's Paul that's doing the writing here. And Paul begins by saying this, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. Now notice what he says. How shall we who die to sin live any longer in it? He's talking about those who have become New Testament Christians. They loved their soul enough that they were obedient to the gospel plan of salvation. They came into a saved relationship with God through Christ. And they were added to the church of Christ. He's writing to them. And he says those words, how shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk, notice, in newness of life. Now I give you all the way down to verse 14. You can go back and you can read that. But notice the call is twofold. Not only to be saved, but to understand that the responsibility is there for us to be a people who walk in newness of life. That the idea of once I'm saved, I stop, isn't, isn't doctrinally right. That once I'm baptized, I'm at the end. No, it's just the, the beginning. From there, the journey begins. From there, the difficulty really starts. Now, as a child of God, you're called to live according to a godly standard. And you see, you ought to love yourself enough not just to be saved, but to stay saved. Well, do we? Well, listen, we can easily judge whether or not we love ourselves enough to be saved and save, stay saved if we have a healthy love for God in which we obey His commandments. Remember John chapter 14 and verse 15. If we don't even love God enough to do what He says, well, then we're not going to love ourselves enough to do what we need to do to be saved and to say, stay saved. Do you love yourself? Are you saved? Do you love yourself? If you are saved, are you living faithfully? Let me give you a second suggestion. We need to remember that we are a wonderful creation. Now, bear with me, you're not a frog. You're not a rabbit. You're not a horse. You're not a giraffe. You're not a dinosaur. You're not a bird. You're not a star. You're not a moon. You're not a meteorite. You're not a bug. You are the crowning achievement of all that God has created. Well, Brother Gellis, I've seen Saturn and its 12 plus moons and all of its glory and its rain. You're better. Oh, Brother Gellis, I've seen some facets. You're better. 
Well, I've stood and I've beheld the grandeur of the grand. Can, can, it fails in comparison to how great you are. One of the things that we need to do is we need to remember that we are God's wonderful, we're crowning achievement of all that he's made. We're wonderfully made. The psalmist said it this way. If you go over to Psalm 139 and verse 14, he says, I will praise you. He's talking to God. I'm going to praise you, God, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous of your, are your works, and my soul knows very well. Love yourself enough that you understand how special you are in God's creation. How special you are. Me, Brother Gellis, you. Out of all that he's made, you. Let me give you one more. We ought to love ourselves enough that we set boundaries. Maybe I have you on everything. I'm with you, brother. You're right. I like everything you said toward God. I agree with you, everything you said toward others. And I like the first two points that you were talking about when we talk about loving toward self. But you, I didn't like that last one. It's where personal responsibility really comes home to roost. How can I manifest a healthy love for myself? I tell myself no. I, I, I live by a, a set of boundaries that God has instituted for my life. Go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and go down to verse 27. He says this, Paul says, But I discipline my body and I bring it into subjection. Why all the effort, Paul? <laughs> Why discipline it? Why bring it into subjection? Think of the image of not just beating something down, but holding something in an embrace. I, I hold it. I hold it so it can't get out of control. I hold it so it's, it's under my control. Have that image. I, I discipline myself in that way, that I can bring myself into subjection. Why? Lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. I don't want to tell ever, others about the glories of God and the wonders of eternity, and I myself will never share in them because I don't discipline myself. Listen, church, there are things that God has said no to. No. It's not a matter of can I do them. Well, sure you can do them. It's a wonderful gift from God called free will. You can go out and live however you want to live. But is it living in accordance to God's will? We show that we love ourselves when we begin to say no. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to be involved in that. I'm not going to give myself over to that. That's not going to be in my life. That's not going to be part of who I am. I'm not going to engage in that over there. I don't care if everybody else is doing it. I don't care if, I've, if others have told me it's acceptable. I don't care if others are arguing about it to determine whether or not it's acceptable. What has God said to me about boundaries? What has God said to me about those things that are acceptable? Because I love myself, I'm going to say no. Because I love myself, I'm going to say, listen, God has said I can go this far and no further, and I'm content with that. Listen, God has given us enough room where we can live and be happy and be full. We can be excited without going past those boundaries that he set. I'm telling you. It's the world that encroaches in upon us and says, just, just come on a little bit further. But God says no. It's the world that begins to, to, to beat down upon us and, and calls us to wrestle. And the world says, come on, come on, come on. And, and God is there saying, listen, it's not good. It's not beneficial. It's not helpful to you. And we have to love ourselves enough to say no to the world and no to God. Now, it's difficult. But it's what we agreed to when we were willing to be clothed with Christ. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 27 to be immersed in those baptismal waters, to have our sins washed away, Acts chapter 22 and verse 16, to be those who are raised in that newness of life so that we embrace all the spiritual blessings that are ours in Christ, Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3, so that we could be members of the body of Christ, Acts chapter 2 and verse 47, so that we become part of the whole, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 27, now you are the body of Christ and members individually. Well, I have to love myself enough to be part of that. And to remain a part of that. Do you? Listen, the, the issue isn't, remember our perspective? How does God love me? We, we talk about that at another time. We've got that. The issue is love from my perspective. Am I okay in these three directions? Am I doing the things that I need to do when it comes to expressing that upward, that outward, and that inward love? And am I expressing it in a way that is good? Or are there some areas that I need to work on? 
Listen, when we realize that we come up short a time or two, here's not, the answer isn't, I quit. The answer is, how can I get better? The answer isn't, oh, I've fallen short of perfection. You, you long since lost perfection. Don't, don't worry about that. The, the answer is, how can I start anew right here and right now and today? Well, things have been a mess, but we're talking about today. Well, I've struggled, but we're talking about today. Well, I, 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 we're talking about today. How, where am I in love from this day forward? Right? God's a great God who showers us with wonderful and abundant love. Are we a people who properly express our love to Him, to others, and to ourselves? I end your outline with, with this. In what direction does your love go? I hope, friends, it goes in these directions. If you're here this morning and you have not embraced the love that God has for you by becoming a New Testament Christian, friend, why wait? Would you consider today in your obedience to the gospel plan of salvation to, to, to hear, believe, repent, confess, and to be baptized? Would you consider today loving God and the love that He has for you to be obedient to Him and to be saved? Uh, listen, it, it's the greatest gift you can have this year to be right with God. If you're not, why not? If you're here today and you're a New Testament Christian but you're going through some struggles, well, would you let us pray with you? Would you let us encourage you? Would you let us reach out to you? And have, listen, our elders are here this morning. They stand ready to get knee to knee and eye to eye with you. They will pray with you. They will love you. They will teach you. They will encourage you. They care about your soul. That's why they're shepherds. Will you let them shepherd you? Will you let them help lead you in a way that brings you closer to God? Or maybe you just need this congregation to pray for you. You're going through a tough time or some difficulties. Listen, we're a praying church. And what a privilege it would be to lift your name up to God. Well, if you're subject to the invitation, let me encourage you to come forward as we stand and sing.